I spent the spring of 2011 studying abroad in Bulgaria. People always ask me where in the United States I was from. No one ever knew where Nebraska was. A Russian friend of mine, to my shock, said he did, but then added, yeah, it's by New York, right? After many failed attempts at describing what made Nebraska special, in frustration I ended up explaining that we have more cattle than people. Despite this being true, I didn't like identifying my home this way. I felt like it really oversimplified what the state has to offer. It's not just the land of corn and cows. I wouldn't have called it inescapable, but I ended up getting drawn into what makes our state what it is. Growing up in the city of Columbus, I never identified with the agriculture industry of the state. When a friend of mine asked me if I want to go out and help on the local sustainable garden in Beaver Crossing, I didn't really have an opinion, but I went anyway. After that first time of actually picking food off the bushes and digging it up from the ground, it became a passion. A few friends and I now work out on the farm every Wednesday afternoon and then help cook a gigantic meal with fresh food from the garden. I can't even begin to express how good and fresh these vegetables are, especially when they're cooked by a woman who's been doing it for over 30 years. I used to think that I didn't like a lot of vegetables. Turns out, I just don't like them from cans or frozen bags. It's become much more than gardening for me though. When I was given a chance to make a documentary, I knew that I wanted to somehow incorporate my new passion and admittedly romanticize a view for local agriculture. I didn't know why I had to, and I didn't know where it would take me. I was still new to the community, but everywhere I turned, I found incredible, passionate people that were all more than welcoming to a newcomer. I started off with not much more than a curiosity, a camera, and the knowledge that I had to pass this class to graduate next month. My project has, fittingly so, remained organic in form as I've traveled to a handful of farms in the area and discovered how astonishingly simple it can be. I can't stress enough that this documentary isn't meant to be persuasive. It's merely a reflection of my personal journey through something new that was captivating me and me trying to figure out why. We're here. I'm going to start off and assume that you know nothing about local sustainable agriculture, just like I didn't. The first thing you will notice is the passion. It's contagious. I mean, that's why I'm here now telling this story. Ross Broccoli, not spelled like the vegetable, is one of any farmer that demonstrates this. The guys from Lincoln did comedy in New York with some of the greats like Louis C.K., David Cross, and Janine Garofalo. He then went on to make a ton of money doing commercials with Holiday Inn. Yet he's just outside Lincoln now, working a small herd of goats, chickens, some llamas, and some vegetables. I knew as soon as I started this documentary that this would be a guy that I wanted to talk to. Hi. Hi. You weren't about to eat that, were you? Um, no. You can order room service, you know, get a hamburger, salad, omelet, whatever you need, you know. Whatever, yeah, any of it. <laughs> Rock on, brother. <laughs> you get a room, we'll bring the food. Holiday Inn gives you more. The Holiday Inn thing, that, I, that, I, that was the only reason I got any exposure, of course. And... That just kind of blew up, really. We, yeah. just, we just had a fun time with it. And, it looks like you guys did. And it was a popular commercial, and and uh, so they, it just kept coming. Like they're gonna do five more this year. I was like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> and it, and then you you keep making more and more money all the time. So I was in that thing. filthy rich, and we just had a blast for down. four or five, five boxes, six, six years. So long. So I just turned those and then started making these ponds and we started this movie called Carpula. Even though I blew all my money on that and stuck truck, now I'm a poor dirt farmer. <laughs> it's right where I want to be. Yeah. You know? This is called duckweed. And uh, it just forms like a, just a, you know, eighth of an inch film mm -hmm. across that. And then 35% yeah. protein and chlorophyll and all kinds of stuff. So. Chickens love it. I, I bet I give them 10 gallons a day. 
and it really helps food feed costs. Oh, Lloydy. I'm going to shoot this one just because it's so boring. <laughs> no personality. Wouldn't it be a great coat, too? Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you imagine a winter coat? He may want to just smell you before. Should I just, like, let yep. him? Yep. Just let just say hello to him. <laughs> hey. Look, yep. Look. There you go. That's all he wants. Nice to meet you, Lloyd. Yep, that's all he wants. <laughs> now you'll have some meat. Northeast of Ross and Lloyd's place is Everett Lundquist and Ruth Chantry's Common Good Farm. In contrast to Ross, Everett takes an almost spiritual approach in his connection to the land and the work. He explained everything so simply. We're building the soil over the long term. Um, a lot of times with the chemical fertilizers, they're actually depleting the soil in the long run. Like if you take away the chemical fertilizers, the soil is dead. The soil is you know, void of any type of fertility. Um, whereas an organically managed, biodynamically managed soil, you're adding things to the soil. The paradigm of chemical agriculture is feed the plant. The paradigm of organic biodynamic agriculture is feed the soil, and then the soil feeds the plant. Everett is ahead of the curve in that their operation is biodynamic. To be biodynamic, a farm has to fulfill organic requirements, as well as other stipulations like setting aside 10% for biodiversity acres, which allow for beneficial insects like ladybugs, praying mantises, and predatory wasps. You know, modern technology's answer is uh, biotechnology. You take a a gene out of a virus and you insert it into a corn plant, very artificial, nothing natural about yeah. it, and every plant, every cell of that plant becomes a, a toxin producer. And so the, the worm goes into the corn and eats the, eats the, eats the tissue of the plant mm -hmm. and it gets killed. One caveat all the farmers mentioned is that organic farming is not easy. It is more work intensive than industrial model. It's worth it to Everett though. Um, no, mostly we're just trying to kind of advertise for biodynamics that uh, there's, there's a health benefit for the, the people, you know, from the food, but there's also a health benefit for the, the soil and the earth. Um, that, uh, I mean, if people look around with astute eyes, they're going to start seeing the signs that the earth is, is failing. In my opinion, the earth's in the hospital at this point. Yeah. <laughs> And we need to do some things uh, to, to help it, uh, to help support its, its health systems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what biodynamics really shines in. If you couldn't tell yet, the second thing I noticed after the unifying passion was the diversity. From Ross's carp ponds to Everett's spiritual approach to the land, the next place I wanted to go was where the local food was sold. This took me to the Old Cheney Farmer's Market. One of the essential uh, pieces to local food is the relationship. So people, you know, the, all the vendors are down here every week and they're, you know, visiting with each other and then you know, the customers are down here as well and they're building relationships, they're getting to know who's growing their food and the products that they're buying down here and um, yeah, it's definitely a key piece too why the market is successful. It's just fun to come and see what everybody has. Mm -hmm. and, see what they have. And, and talk to them, them and find and out yeah. you know, tips for what would make mine better. It's not like they're just here selling their wares. They're actually you got the information if you have questions about anything. They're pretty good about sharing. Oh yeah, these are the experts. They know yeah. how to grow everything. Yeah. <laughs> At the market, I was able to meet Mary and ask her if I could come out and visit her and her husband Ben's Bison Ranch. I had no idea when I started this documentary that I would have the fortune of be able to visit a ranch with the animals that I had romanticized before I even got involved with farming. So much so that I even have a tattoo that Mary and Ben were all too eager to have me show their herd. With the buffalo. With the buffalo. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. <laughs> They're so um, majestic, just very amazing creatures as far as their survivability out here. Um, you know, they've been here for 
many, many, many years yeah. longer than we have. And so they've, you know, they've learned how to survive the winters here. It was reassuring to find out that I wasn't alone with my infatuation with the animal and my growth into appreciation for sustainable ag. Having grown up in the larger farming mentality, uh, you know, I, I grew up, everything was sprayed. They're, they're stewards of the land, but it's a different mentality. It's it's a steward to the crop that is immediately growing, not, yeah. not exactly. trying not to the culture the bacteria culture the and yeah. the other indigenous animals. It is that crop and only that, and mm -hmm. you kill everything else. You can go up yeah. yeah. The ranch is really a surreal moment for me. I mean, I even got to feed one named Nelly its favorite alfalfa treats. <laughs> you got slime. Yeah, that's cool though. <laughs> <laughs> Stick that tongue out once. <laughs> <laughs> After feeding Nellie, my next stop was Branch Oak Farm, where their specialty is dairy cattle. I got to see the milking firsthand, and then just two doors down, I got to see their cheese processing facilities. The cheeses we make here are very labor intensive. We can't make cheese that puts us up against craft because they've got it figured out. They right? got the mass production down. And, and they've got the economy of scale and all that. Mm -hmm, so. Sure. For the Dittmans, it really seemed to all come down to food and how important it is in such a simple way. Yeah, what would different. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness be if you can't choose what you eat? <laughs> Doug, who comes off as a philosopher farmer cross, left me with something that I haven't been able to quite check off and always come back to. I'm from, yeah, I grew up in Columbus. Yeah, I think our idea of agriculture was really you, uh, these fields and essentially corn and beans, mm -hmm. and you grow this anonymous commodity, and then you dump it at the co-op, and then it goes somewhere from there. Yeah. <laughs> so, looking at it from food's a different perspective. Really, we have this huge landscape with nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there really is a disconnect in our society between food and where it comes from and what is even in it. Until I started going out to these farms, I didn't really have a concept of where food came from. I mean, it just comes from the grocery store, right? The next and last person on my farm tour, seems she would have agreed with Doug. I think it's important to yeah, get this out absolutely. to people so they realize, you know, um, the most important thing is, is, and I say this a lot, and you've probably all heard it, you have a lot of power as the consumer to change things. Mm -hmm. You do not have to buy into these industrial models and eat that type of food. So, you know, you probably can't stop the war in Afghanistan. And you probably can't do a lot of things, but you eat every day, and how you eat and what you choose to eat is huge. Mm -hmm. One of the most refreshing and interesting things that I saw on all my trips out to the various farms was the community. These people are all in the same business, but it's not a competition. They help each other out and form partnerships. And no place was this more evident than Liz's. While I was on her farm, I was able to meet her former intern, Kelly, Mark, a neighbor who was helping for the day, Larry, her business partner, and two graduate students from the university who are doing research on bird songs. We had kind of just a round table discussion as the people told me why they were there. I found out that there are twice as many species of birds and twice the total amount of birds on organic farms as opposed to the standard industrial model. And these birds are then eating more insects. With this being the last farm that I visited, I asked Liz to sum up her farming philosophy, and after spending several afternoons with many of the other farmers, I think most would agree. Well, all I could say is I feel that this is great honor for me to take care of the earth, 
and this is something that I've always wanted to do. It's definitely a challenge. It can be lonely. It can be hard work. Um, I think that the people who are out here trying to do this are doing the best job they can. Um, you have different philosophies, different ideas of how to make profit, but I feel that this is a great um, this is a great thing that I've been entrusted with, taking care of our natural resources for our next generation. And I don't know any better job than what I'm doing now. So I guess that would sum it up. Uh, As I said in the beginning, this documentary was not meant to be persuasive. It just was a personal exploration. I have a hard time expressing how my travels to these farms and my work over the past four months has been much bigger than me playing with llamas and bison. It has been there in the back of my mind the whole time as I prepare to graduate and struggle with what that means, as well as many of the same questions I had as a college freshman. Questions about love, happiness, friendship, the future, still remain uncertain, but this documentary has given me something. With its completion, I've moved forward. I've pinned the final lines of the chapter. My questions are not easy ones, ones that can be answered in as few pages as have been written. But with going out to these calm, beautiful places, talking to these unbelievable people who seem to have it figured out, standing there and working on much more than assignment, I've learned, I've grown, I feel on the right path, I still don't know the answers, but that's not the point. It isn't finished yet. 